bus driver cruises by, like just flies by, slams on its brakes, opens the door, and he goes, "You magic, you magic." And I was like, "Yeah, what's up, man?" He's like, "I love your story, man. I love it." And then just closed the door and kept driving. Don't cut it and come back. After 10 years in the minors, 34-year-old, yes I said it, 34-year-old Ricky is making waves for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Yeah, he spent a decade riding the bus, but Drew Maggi is in the bigs. Even more exciting for him, I'm sure. He's our guest today. Bradley Bill to the Suns, would that even matter to the Nuggets and Jokic in the West? From Wondery, I'm Ryan Shazier. And I'm Dave Damashek. And this is Don't Call the Comeback. Don't call it a comeback. I've been waiting on this moment my whole life. You can't call it a comeback. Everybody see your feet, make arenas ride. Yeah, I'm saying from the left to right, we get it on tonight. We do it all, but we don't back down. Just give me one shot, one chance, I'ma take it. Fixing up the game, but these records I keep on breaking. Break it. Hey, Shay, let's get into this Drew Maggi comeback story. As you wish, 5 Drew's story starts back in 2008 when he graduated high school and got drafted in the 47th round of the MLB draft by the Arizona Diamondbacks, which was great because that's his hometown team. But instead of going pro, he went to play for the Arizona State Sun Devils and quickly became one of the best shortstops in all the land. Here's Maggi. He swings, hits it high and deep to left. Going back is Dozier on the warning track to the fence. He leaps up. It's gone. A home run. In 2010, the Pittsburgh Pirates selected Drew in the 15th round, but this time the young Bucko signed to go pro. After five years in the Pirates organization, he hadn't cracked the big league lineup. For eight more years, Drew bounced around from the Angels to the Dodgers, Indians, Twins, and Phillies minor league systems until he wound up back in Pittsburgh in August 2022. But on his second stint in Pittsburgh, things were different. On April 23rd, 2023, 5,435 days after first being drafted by the Pirates, he received a call he'd been waiting on for 13 years. It is with great pleasure that I get to promote uh, my first person to the major leagues and someone that is tremendously uh, important to this group and someone that exemplifies grit. So imagine... You're going to get an opportunity to drop. Speech only. The video of Maggie's call up went viral, and he was greeted by a standing O when he made his first at bat in Pittsburgh three days later. Number 39, Drew Maggie will pinch hit for Andrew McCutcheon, making his major league debut. All right, Shay's here. This is going to be good. He's here. The moment has arrived. I am now in a hotel lobby, hence a little bit of background noise. I'm sure you and Maggie are used to that yourselves as uh, road warriors. Here to tell his story, like I say, we've got Major League store cho- Shortstop Drew Maggie on the show. Drew, welcome to Don't Call It a Comeback. How are you, man? Uh, I'm good, man. You're, you're doing that road living right now. That's right. You Just, know what uh, I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's an honor to be here. An homage to you. Thank you again, Drew, for uh, joining us, man. We really appreciate it. You know, both of us are, uh, I wouldn't say I'm all the way a Yenzer yet because I, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but I'm, I'm almost a Yenzer. I've been here for 10 years. So uh, we really appreciate you and we really look forward to talking to you, man. So, uh, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. No, I want to start off all the way from the beginning because this is a comeback show. So I want to start away, all the way back from the beginning. So, you know, when you first came out of high school and you got drafted in 2010, what made you choose Pittsburgh over Arizona? I got drafted, drafted in Pittsburgh for, by Pittsburgh. And yeah, just uh, that's kind of just where my road started back in 2010. Geez, so long ago. But yeah, so I mean, obviously growing up in Arizona, like playing for the Diamondbacks would have been a dream come true for me. But you know, starting out with Pittsburgh, that's, you know, they drafted me. I went, I went out to Pitt and that's where I signed. You know, that's where I started my career. They, they took me around the city, you know, the bridges around. Um, I got to go on the field. My parents were there. So I, I mean, I fell in love with Pittsburgh very, you know, at a young age. I was 21 years old, just coming out of college. And, yeah, just like I remember being on the field and, you know, right before I signed because it was a tough decision to make because, 
you know, I love college. I was coming out as a sophomore. I had a lot of leverage. I could have gone back to school. And I just remember being in the city, being on the field, and just kind of having a feeling of, you know, this, it just everything felt right. You know, it just kind of fell in love with the city, the field. So yeah, I'd made a decision right there. You know, I was right outside, you know, the dugout and was just like, this is, this is it. You know, this is, I'm going to start my career now. I'm going to sign and, you know, just kind of, kind of went from there. So, so what's the calculation for you in, in that moment? Is it like, I'll see you again, PNC Park in about two years. I have to toil a bit in the minor leagues or is that, are, are you more um, realistic about the, the path of how tough it is for a minor leaguer to get all the way to the bigs? Yeah, I mean, I really had no no idea about professional baseball at that point. So for me, and I think a lot of young players, you know, I kind of, you know, I'm a goal guy. So I, I made a kind of like an inside kind of goal to, you know, get to the big leagues within two or three years. I was kind of, you know, my, what I was thinking. And yeah, on the field, I, I remember being, I'm going to be in PNC. I'm going to play here one day. So yeah, I mean, little did I know it would, you know, kind of go full circle and it would take me back there 13 years later. But yeah, as a, as a young kid, you know, just had having no clue, you know, professional baseball, pro sports, you know, really being an adult and kind of going through, you know, crazy things and kind of growing as a man did I, did I start to realize how hard it was. The thing that's so crazy to me when it comes to baseball is how, how uh, baseball, basketball, golf, a lot of other major sports, they have that, you know, the, the minor process, they have the, the you know, the, the league before the major, uh, the, the, the majors. And, you know, with NFL, you don't really, you don't really have that. You just have college. So every time I learn more and more about just the, the minors and, and how, uh, the process is, it's always interesting to me. Every time I talk to somebody that plays baseball, it's always interesting to me. So when you were going through the whole process and, you know, playing all those years and then coach Crab gives you a call, like what was going through your head? Well, it's crazy. It's the minor leagues have changed so much too, since I first started, because you used to have to go through a process. I learned you would start in, in rookie ball, You'd go to low A, high A, double A, triple A, and it was kind of this road to the show, and everyone did it. You know, the look, Garrett Cole, I, I started out with him. He went, you know, high A, low A, uh, double A, triple A, and then to the big leagues, it took him some time. You know, now you're kind of seeing the 21-year-old, you know, number one draft picks kind of, you know, go up right away. Like the Henry Davis just made his debut last night. He got drafted in 21. So over time, the minor leagues have changed so much. But for me, you know, when, when Krabby, you know, called my name and, you know, you told me I was going to the big leagues, it was, uh, it was emotional. You know, it, it, you just kind of flash back to, to all the different, you know, situations you've been in, things you've experienced, how long it's actually been, because when you're in it, you don't really think about it. You know, you make adjustments, you're, you're trying to figure out, you know, how you can break the big leagues, how you can continue to play. And there's just so much that goes into that, you know, keeping your body right, your mind right. I mean, you know, going through, I mean, there were so many things. I mean, I had to deal with COVID, the COVID situation where, you know, I kind of thought my career might've been over there because a lot of guys were getting, kind of laid off they were only selecting a few guys to go we, we had an alternate site where guys would go just in case you know there was a breakout or you know they needed guys so you know I was lucky enough by the twins to you know they called me in the middle of the summer and were like hey Drew we want you to come out so I mean from that I mean there's just so many different things that had to happen for for me to get you know my my opportunity in April so you know, just also like really thankful, you know, to a lot of different people. You know, it was just, it was a big emotional buildup because my family was there who had been so supportive to me. I was getting flooded with texts, calls from former teammates, players that, and just friends too, that have just helped me throughout my journey. 
you know, obviously I couldn't have, you know, done any of this alone. So there was just a lot of emotion and just thinking back to, to all the different things that helped me get to this point. So it was, yeah, it's, I, it was cool. I want to hear, I want to hear about that, you know, the, the, the destiny, uh, the destination and, uh, you know, McCutcheon and all, all those fellas and interacting with all those. But first let's go back. And I also want to hear about the road life, but you mentioned the twins there. So in 21, you're called up, but then you don't get an AB. So how uh, uh, how does that uh, you know how how was that little episode in your baseball life? It was bittersweet, you know. It uh, you know I had such a great season in AAA. I had one of my best seasons. So you know they they called me up. I was I was coming in from a flight from Louisville, and we were at baggage claim, and our manager came up to me and was like, "Hey." You're going to go up there and be on the taxi squad, which basically you just travel with the team. And, you know, when I got there, I took the flight. It was cool, the big league flight. And then I got there and they're like, all right, you can take BP, but you can't stay for the game. So that first night, you know, went on the field, said what's up to all the guys, met everybody. And, yeah, took BP. And then I, I took it back to the hotel. I was watching the game. I ordered some room service, you know, kind of acting like a big leaguer. And uh, our uh, Ref Schneider, our left fielder, dive and play, kind of hurt his shoulder. So I was kind of like, oh, you know, because obviously that's a shame. Yeah, I was, I was, (laughs) I was the next man up. So I was thinking, okay, you know, maybe, maybe they'll activate me. So I went in the next day, and yeah, Rocco Baldelli called me into his office. Kind of played a little prank on me, kind of, you know, what did you do last night? Where were you? You know, that whole deal. And then he said, congratulations, you're a big leaguer. So obviously from that point, you know, I was crying, calling my parents, family. And and then, yeah, it just I didn't play. So that kind of took over the story. I, you know, I came back in the off season. And everyone's like, you know, what the hell? Like, you know, you couldn't play. You got up there. You didn't play. So it was kind of tough for me in a way because, you know, I had this great season. I finally became a big leaguer, but then the questions were, you know, why didn't you get in there? You know, what the heck happened? You, you guys are in last place. They couldn't get you an AB. So I just kind of had to, you know, bite my tongue and kind of wear those punches. Did that encourage you more that you had reached the bigs, but you didn't get an AB or you're like, I finally made it and I don't even get to, to get one hack at it. Forget this. I'm done. Yeah, no, it, it encouraged me. Definitely. I, I mean, not in like a hateful way, you know, obviously the twins call me up and obviously call me back. That's who I was with during COVID, you know, they could have just gotten rid of me then. So obviously I, there was no hard feelings there, but it definitely motivated me in a way to, to get that at bat, to, to get on the field because, you know, I was a big leaguer, but, you know, I was on the sideline, you know, I was watching basically doing the same thing just with a different title. So, you know, definitely pushed me in and, you know, it's crazy how it all sounds because, you know, everything kind of happened for a reason. And, you know, if I had gotten in with the twins, you know, it probably wouldn't have blown up into this big story. And so it's, it's definitely, uh, I, I'm definitely a believer and, you know, things happen for a reason and it definitely motivated me and probably extended my career for a couple of years because who knows if I would have gotten in there, maybe I would have been satisfied hmm. and just kind of shut it down and just been like, Oh, I did it. You know, I'm, now I'll go on and kind of live my life. So, and it, it definitely got me up in the morning, got me in the gym, you know, kind of re-inspired me in different ways. So it was it was kind of cool in that sense. I know, like just playing sports and all the hard work that you put in, and you actually you feel like you have the opportunity, but it's not there. That's that's one of the I know that's one of the toughest things to deal with. Just uh, you know, just playing sports in general. So as you continue to play in you know in the minors, like what 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 is like the road life like? What is it like? You know, because I know a lot of times people are not used to experiencing. You know, like, all right, 
This is what Kim looks like. This is what, you know, what, what it's like in Altoona. This is what it's like in, you know, in Bradenton. Like, what was it like going through all those transitions, understanding that you kind of knew the process when you were with a lot of guys that, that kind of was, you know, always kind of like, oh, I mean, I don't know what's next. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely like tougher some years than others. You know, you're sometimes you play in great cities. Sometimes you're in these smaller cities that you've never heard of. You know, you're in this little suitcase traveling through the night on a bus, you know, playing cards, drinking beer, telling stories. Um, you know, sometimes you're with guys of your own age. You know, for me this year, you know, I'm kind of the older veteran guy. So I'm with a bunch of 21 to 23 year olds that, you know, I remember being in their shoes. They they think they have it all figured out, but they don't. So, you know, just kind of being that veteran guy. But yeah, I mean, traveling through, you know, an eight hour bus, you get in at about 4 a.m., you take a nap, you wake up at about noon, you head to the field, go through your preparation, play a game. And then, you know, back in the day, we used to have, you know, three day sets, you know, you'd be in a city for three games. You'd have a travel day, you travel through the night, play the next day, three three or four games in that city, then you'd come back home and it was just like this cycle. And now it's you know, you travel you have every Monday off. So this is kind of how the minor leagues have changed. You have every Monday off. So every Sunday is a travel day and you'll get in, you know, Monday, have that off day, and then the next day you're kind of playing. But yeah, I mean it's and and also, I mean, I've I've kind of chose to embrace it a little bit because of how hard it is. I've kind of, you know, kind of looked at the positives and kind of things of, you know, hey, I'm in a new city, you know, let's go check out, you know, the I was in Lehigh Valley last year, there was the Liberty Bell, you know, there's been cool museums, little, you know, rivers, like, you know, kind of outdoorsy stuff, so trying to just, you know, see the world a little bit, you know, it's kind of been cool in that sense of, you know, I get to say I've been in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And if I went to Arizona and told my friends, they're like, well, I don't even know what is that a city. <laughs> so, so yeah. And then also just, you know, living the apartment life, you know, road to road, you know, I'm in a four bedroom apartment here with, with five guys. So you know, you got a guy sleeping out in the living room. You got guys, you know, guys in the room next to me, room behind me. So <laughs> are you then bathrooms. in that equation? I'm sure you've answered this a million times. I apologize. Answer it for a million and first. So it sounds like it really does, even with the 21st century updates, mirror kind of what we see in Bull Durham. And you're the Bull Durham of the equation, right? I mean, the older guy, oh. the sage who everybody leans on for the counsel of how to do things. <laughs> I mean, to a T kind of. I mean, especially as I've gotten older, I mean, now it's, yeah, I'm the kind of the storyteller, you know, if, if there's a bus time that we need, you know, Madge, when are we taking the bus, you know, any sort of, you know, how, how do we, what do we, how do we go about this? What do we kind of do? I'm kind of a little bit of a voice, you know, I have a little hmm. voice of reason here. So, and, you know, I've just seen a lot throughout the years in the mind, you know, I mean, I obviously haven't seen everything, but, you know, I've I've gone through it. I know how to get through the year. So, yeah, I'm definitely – the Bull Durham, I mean, that's perfect. You know, and I – I mean, what a great movie. Hey, so. I'm, I'm, Shay Zier's never yeah, seen I, that, have you? Yeah, I was about to say, uh, uh, Shaq, you're going to have to tell me what Bull Durham <laughs> means uh, because I – yeah. it's, it's, it's a sports movie classic, <laughs> man. It's considered one of the all-time best. When did, when did that movie come out, Shaq? I don't oh, know geez. when it came out. Come on, hey, man. before you were alive, hey, all right? Probably, you know, probably. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I was before. I was what nineties, maybe. Yeah, so. Oh, I, I bet. 80s? I would think. Yeah, I think eighties. Yeah. If it was in the eighties, I was not born. So I'm just letting you know that. So. Yeah, I think it was eighties. Costner, classic Kevin Costner. Drew, your first hit in the MLB was a single. Like, what was going through your mind, like when you like? you know, ran the base and, and ended up on first base and like, you know, and probably like just thought about everything that you've been through. Like what, what was your, like what was going through your head once you, once you got that single? 
there's there's so much different things that enter your mind, you know, because you, you know, especially for me, I don't know when I'm going down, particularly in that at bat, I knew I knew I was going down after that at bat. So, yeah, it was kind of like a, a this is this could be my last chance, you know, so kind of being on deck, walk into the plate. I kind of had this feeling of, you know, I kept telling myself, you know, in the third person, just, okay, Madge, you know, you got to do something here. You know, this is, this is, this could be your last chance ever stepping in the box, having an opportunity to get that first hit. So, you know, kind of walk into the plate, you know, I wouldn't say nerves or nervous, but it was just kind of this feeling of it's go time, you know, let's, let's make something happen. And it was, it was funny because throughout the at bat, you know, I'd step out of the box and I'd kind of be thinking in my head, you know, this is it. You got to make something happen. And then I would step in and I'd be like, screw it. You know, I'm hacking. I'm going, you know, I'm going out hacking. I'm going to try to get this done. And so it was kind of this battle, this internal battle inside of just kind of this warrior. And then this just thinking about too much, you know, this is the last at bat, but and then the whole at bat, you know, it was a it was like a three minute at bat. I I ended up breaking my bat during it. So, you know, just taking pitches. I fouled off a few pitches. I remember thinking, I, this is crazy. You know, can I just get a hit and get this over with? And you know that uh, we were in D.C. and the crowd was chanting my name, which was still, I mean, just trying to take that all in. And yeah, just seeing it go through the middle and, you know, I'm running down first and just happy. And then thinking in my head, you know, I did it, you know, I finally, I did it, you know, I have this forever and just being on first and just, you know, I took a deep breath. I was just like, whoa, you know, just my body, I was just filled with so much like different things going on, but it was, uh, and you unsheathed I mean, the cutlass at the, at uh, Cutchin Company, right? Yeah, the, I, oh, yeah. I, I didn't imagine that you did. You know about that Chazier, right? The Buckos when they uh, when they get a big base hit, they uh, they do the imaginary cutlass from their waistline. Yeah, uh, I, I, the sword. Yes, yeah, I've I seen deaf people definitely do the sword before, but I didn't know what it really meant. You know, I'm still learning here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so it's like our thing we do that you know, like when you do something cool or you get a big hit or. You know, I've definitely seen people do it a bunch of times. So now I know what it means. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, like, <laughs> Drew, I, I love I love it because, like, Drew, like, what was your experience with the city of Pittsburgh and just the fans? And even, like you said, in D.C. with the fans, when they're cheering your name, like, what was that experience like? Because most people don't understand what it's like. 90, 99% of people in America doesn't know what, it's, what it feels like for for people to be calling you like thousands of people to be calling your name in a moment after you're doing something great, after you're doing something good, you know, something that is incredible in your life. Like what was that moment like and how did the city embrace you and how did you in, enjoy that experience? I It was uh, when I was in Pittsburgh, I mean, it was the best time of my life. It was the people and it was a little cool out too, you know, it was like 55 degrees. So you kind of had that, you know, you're breathing in kind of that cold air and I'm from Arizona, so I'm not used to that, but you know, just, you know, when I was walking to the field, my third day there, so I, I was at the first game. I didn't play at the second game. I didn't play. I was walking with my brothers to the field and we're just sitting there kind of like looking up, like kind of checking out the city and a bus driver cruises by like, just flies by, slams on its brakes, opens the door, and he goes, you magic? You magic? And I was like, yeah, what's up, man? He's like, I love your story, man. I love it. And then just closed the door and kept driving. That's awesome, man. <laughs> and my brother and I, like, it was the bus driver, you know? like, And then, yeah, just, you know, I'd go into, I went into a restaurant called McFadden's. Yeah. The bar owner came over to me. Um, you know, a bunch of people came over to me and were talking to me. It was just, you know, the city was just embraced me and, you know, it was just like a cool blue collar city, tough and, you know, just loyal, respected and, you know, just, yeah, being in that moment in Pittsburgh and, 
you know, I can't thank them enough because, you know, getting to the big leagues is hard and how long it took me and to people to kind of understand that and be inspired by that. And just, they made the moment so cool for me because when I, you know, was going to the plate and, you know, they called my name and obviously for me, everything was happening so fast. I'm trying to breathe, take it all in. And yeah, I look out to right field and I see people start to stand up and then I hear chant, my name being chanted. And I'm, and I'm just like, what is going on? Like these, these fans are, <laughs> they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know what to do. I, I was like, do I take off my helmet? Do I, like, how long do I stand here? And I ended up giving, you know, kind of like this awkward wave, but they just made the the whole experience a, a special for me. And, you know, I'm, I'll be a Pittsburgh fan for life. And I mean, I would have been regardless, but just, and then they traveled to DC, you know, when we went to DC, there was a lot of Pittsburgh fans there. So, I mean, they probably started the chance. People are chopping at the bit, as you can probably pick up on the banks of the Three Rivers for uh, for the Buckos to be relevant. And while Drew Maggi was there, they were that in 2023. Now that you're back um, in the minor, so is it again to pick back up on that Bull Durham thread? Is it is it like tell us what it was like? What well, are the hotels way better? Is the food way better? Is that the kind of are, are those the yarns you're spinning these days? Oh yeah, they. Uh... I mean, yeah, it's such a young team. You know, it's we have 20-year-olds. We just got a guy up from high A that's 19. Can't even drink, you know. So everyone, yeah, I'm trying. And, I'm, and I like to, you know, I, I think that's why I've been able to stay in the game a long time too is because I love talking to younger players. I love, you know, kind of teaching things that I went through. So kind of having that, that big league experience now you know, I've, we've had a couple meetings where I've kind of, you know, talked about the feeling, talked about, you know, kind of the experience of it all, how to kind of handle it. And yeah, and just kind of being trying to inspire them to, to improve their game, improve the things that they can to be able to, to do that because it's special, man. I mean, being on the biggest stage in the world, it's, you know, that's what it's all about. So yeah, just trying to, they, yeah, they're at the spreads, how are the hotels, how are the girls, how, you know, just all the whole experience. They want and all everything. of those things are way better. All I mean, it really oh. does for all your expectations of all the years you were on the road, what you were dreaming of, it, it lived up to all of it in every oh, one of it was, those. It was way better. <laughs> okay. I mean, it was, it was way better. I can't, I couldn't even believe it. We were, we were in DC when I got my first check and I, I woke up. And I knew payday was coming. I, you know, I looked, uh, I looked at my phone. I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, I can't believe <laughs> how much they get paid. And we ended up, our hotel was attached to a mall. So I, I walked around the mall. I bought, I bought a bunch of stuff. So <laughs> yeah, it was, it was way better. I know how, how much you love baseball and I love football the same amount. And for me, I ended up transitioning out of the game a lot sooner than I wanted to. And you're getting to play the game, you know, for it's been 13 years is are you still thinking like, hey, you're, you're still trying to make it to the bigs or are you kind of like, man, I'm, you know, I'm 34 years old. I'm kind of a little bit nervous about what's next. Like what like what is your thinking right now? It's like you said, man, you love football. And I, you know, for me, baseball is my love. So, you know, and I think that that's why I've been able to play for so long, too, is because I love it. And I always told myself that, you know, I'm going to play until they rip the jersey off. So that's that's kind of where my head's at now. Like being in Altoona, back in Altoona, I'm, I'm trying to, to get back to the big leagues, help the Pirates win. And, yeah, so it's, you know, what's next for me, it's I'm kind of kind of I've been thinking on that, you know, like that's normal kind of, you know, do I want to stay in the game? Do I want to manage? Do I, you know, how can I help kind of the next generation coming through kind of thought about ways to do that, you know, cause sports is for me, it's what it's all about. It's, it's, it's what's inside me. So, you know, being able to be around it, it would, it would have to be something like that. But, but yeah, for now it's uh, I'm in the present, man. I'm, I'm here. I'm still playing baseball. I know I'm in double A still, but 
you know, I'm going to do everything I can to get back up there and, you know, see what else. I mean, sports are crazy, you know, so maybe there's a little more in there. Man, it's uh, the story to this point is a, is a great one, a slow burn. I don't have to tell you that, but uh, but from in 2023, watching it play out over those few days, it was really something special in a 162 day stretch. I don't have to tell you again about the doldrums of a baseball season sometimes, but boy, this was a real highlight in 2023, whether you're a Pittsburgh Pirates fan. Congratulations to you, man. It was, it really was uh, something to watch and we appreciate uh, you telling us some of your story today. Yeah. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. Thankful. Cool to meet you guys for sure. One more time, thank you to Drew Maggi and congratulations on his great tale here in 2023. Next up for us, Liam Hendricks was back pitching until he got hurt again. Did he come back too fast? Time for some other comeback stories in the news we need to give a look at this week. This is The Checkdown. Shazier, you mentioned it at the top of the show. Bradley Beal dealt to the Phoenix Suns, teaming up presumably with Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, although the contract situations in Phoenix are a real mess. Why should I care about this trade? The Suns are just going to lose to the Nuggets in the playoffs again. True or false? Man, this is a really tough one because having Bradley Beal, who's probably arguably a top 25 player, or arguably not based off of a fan of the Wizards uh, once told me, uh, is... (laughs) Adding them to the Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and DeAndre Aiden and Sons, man, it's really difficult because the biggest thing with the Nuggets is that nobody can really stop Jokic. So they they can't stop Jokic, but with them adding so much pieces on the offensive side, so much scoring on the offensive side, they really went all in on offense and was like, hey, let's let's see what we can do because Denver's not really known for defense. So if you can put up more points than Denver puts, Denver puts up points, then you have a better chance of winning the game. And I think that's what the Suns, like the route that they went. And it's kind of crazy because like sports has always been defense when you championships, defense when you championships. But you obviously seen with the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics that defense then when you championships this year, offense when you championships because Jokic, Jamal Murray and that plethora of role players that they have around them. With them having those four major players, now their role, their role players are not going to be that good. They're not going to be significant. So when their bench comes onto the comes into the game, it's going to be it's going to be difficult. But I think this is probably one of the you know most like we're going for the W, we're going for the win approaches that I've seen in a very long time. Yeah, I don't know if they'll be able to even keep Aiton because of how heavy those other contracts are. But yeah, I think to your point about Jokic, absolutely no one can stop him when he gets the ball on the offensive side of the floor. I think you have to make him work. You need to add somebody to your roster that's at least going to force Jokic to defend and maybe tucker him out a little bit. That's the best I think you can do. But maybe we'll see a swing back towards fives having more prominent roles beyond just Denver. Um, as teams try to match the defending super the def- Super Bowl champs, the defending NBA champions. The day this episode airs is Thursday, June 22nd. It's the day that your guy, Victor Wembayana, or I guess he's about to be your guy because he's going to your favorite team, the San Antonio Spurs. Will Wemby be enough to get Pop back to the finals before he retires, Shazier? Man, so that's very that's such a gray area because Greg Popovich is one of those guys that so was the like, top of Popovich's head. Zing. <laughs> Old joke. Hmm. Hey, uh Greg. I don't know I don't know if it's the I don't know if it, if it's the lighting or if it's just you, but it, it looks like the top of yours is pretty gray as well. So uh <laughs> but are you are you sure hey, you want to go into that area hey, now? I have I have zero hair, so I'm cool with it. But I think that's a very I think that's a very, very gray area because Greg Popovich is one of those type of guys that be like, hey, breaking news, Greg Popovich retires Wednesday, the day before the draft. Like he's that type of guy. You just don't know what he's gonna do. And to me, if he coaches for you know, three to five more years. I think it's a real possibility because the Spurs, they got the number one pick and then they also have a lot of draft picks in the next few years. So if we mess around and trade some of those draft picks up 
but are bringing some more key pieces to play around Victor because our team is a very solid team. We have a lot of good pieces around uh, Victor, and they're all young, so they'll be able to develop together. So um, if he does make it to the finals, I think it'll be more in our like third, or fourth year, I don't know if it's going to be in the first two years. Yeah, it's usually a rookie isn't such a phenom that he can drag an entire team to the finals right out of the gate there. But yeah, you know, the, let's keep in mind the West is kind of soft. Um, the Lakers and Dubs, two of the more prominent teams, are kind of long in the tooth. I think it's reasonable to think if Pop sticks around, like you say, for three to five years, that the Spurs might have a finals run in them. White Sox pitcher Liam Hendricks returned to baseball after being diagnosed with cancer last December, but Hendricks is going back on the injured list with elbow inflammation, probably caused by rushing to get back on the field once the cancer went into remission. 5-0 for athletes working their way back from grave injuries. How do they fight the temptation to go too fast? That's a very hard battle to fight because I remember when my first year, my rookie year, my first two seasons, I missed a total of 16 games. And for those who don't know how long a football season is, it's 17 games now, but when I was playing, it's 16 games, which makes me sound old because, you know, they're making so many rule changes already. But it it just, the first year I ended up hurting my knee. And I was trying to rush back. I was a rookie. I was trying to, like, be in the conversation of rookie of the year. Then I went back out there, hurt my knee again. Literally the, the first game I got back out there. And sometimes just the competitor in us just want to get back out there and play and prove that the type of player that we are, prove what we can do, prove that, hey, Liam was a – he was an all-star to prove that, hey, I'm still an uh, all-star type of player. And for you to – have to sit out and watch everybody else around you play to watch your team win games without you. It makes you feel like you're not needed. And the one thing about sports guys never feel like they don't want to be needed. And I think that's a very tough, tough place to be. And you know, you, you have to have a very, you have to have a very self conscious, you have to be very self-conscious and you have to have a team around you. That's not going to let you force your way into it. Because sometimes when some players say I'm ready, You know, the coaches and the staff are like, hey, we believe in you. But then, you know, some coaches, staff and some training staff will say, hey, I know you think you're ready, but we're looking at you, the the way you're running, the way you're throwing, the way you're cutting. We don't like it. It It's not, it's not, you're not even at 90% yet. We don't want you to risk injury again. And, you know, that's kind of like the give and take you have to have with the team. And it's a very tough situation. Well, a very different kind of comeback than the one Drew Maggi just made, but, or uh, I guess, first effort in the big leagues but hopefully there's some inspiration that uh, these two big leaguers can provide for each other for now that's it for this episode of don't call it a comeback so make sure to follow rate and review the show on wherever you're listening check us out on youtube on the wondery channel and make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss no episodes see you all next week don't call it a comeback i've been waiting on this moment my whole life can't call it a comeback Everybody to your feet, make arenas ride. Yeah, I'm saying from the left to right, we get it on tonight. We do it all, but we don't back down. Just give me one shot, one chance, I'ma take it. Fixing up the game, but these records I keep on breaking. Break.